Now we're here for a very important part. We're gonna be honoring one of our grand marshals, Danny Buttonberry. And I have some very special guests with me um, to celebrate. We're just gonna talk, honor, learn together. Uh, so depending on how your windows are sorted, you'll see that we have Rebecca Heineman and Janelle Jaquez, as well as Jim Simmons. So I'll let you introduce yourselves in, in that order. Rebecca, maybe tell a little bit about your journey as a game creator. As a game creator, well, first I started off by uh, being a game player. Um, That's true. I won the Atari National uh, 26, the Atari 2600 Space Invaders Tournament in 1980, and I became the national champion. Um, after that, I started doing Atari 2600 games for Avalon Hill, uh, London Blitz, and Out of Control. And then afterwards did some stuff with Wisco Boone. And then eventually when we all got fired at Boone, we formed a new company called Interplay and was instrumental in the formation of that company and was there for 11 and a half years, creating pretty much almost every game there for those years. Um, so things <laughs> like Art Scale 3, Dragon Wars, Mind Shadow, Task Knights and Tone Town. That's just a small number of games that I have developed and designed over the years. I can't get over that you actually basically invented esports and in fact were the first champion in the history of esports. Little history for everyone there. First champion ever, right here. It was uh, it was a different time because I still remember when they were doing the actual finals. Um, they were weighing it because they thought it was going to be a sudden death. But when they realized that only one of the five players um, dropped out. The other four of us were easily going to play the game for 24 hours straight. And you had like 200 news media from the brand new CNN and you know, NBC and ABC and New York Times. And they're all starting to go like, because, <laughs> you know, Space Invaders is not necessarily a spectator sport. <laughs> and, uh, well, they learn as they go. <laughs> but... That was the first, and I was the one who was right place, right time, and I was able to win it. <laughs> that is fantastic. Janelle, Janelle, share, share a bit of your history and your story. Okay, I'm just going to do a bit, because otherwise I could give a half hour presentation. Okay. I started out in tabletop gaming, Dungeons and Dragons, um, back in 1976. Um, my first claim to fame is I am the designer and publisher of the second independent standalone Dungeons and Dragons adventure. I mean, even before TSR. Um, that's my claim to fame. Um, went on from there to design for a small publisher that was doing licensed product for Dungeons and Dragons. So I wrote game adventures that are still in print 40 some years later and being picked up by new publishers. So that's my start as tabletop. Um, from that, I jumped <clears> in, <throat> I lucked into, it's who you know, where, right time, right place, right person. Um, I ended up at Coleco just about um, two years ahead or year and a half ahead when they decided to do the Coleco vision. Mm -hmm. And I ended up being last person standing in the game design, divine, game design group and by default became its manager. And so I put together the first um, multidiscipline, one of the first multidiscipline uh, video game development teams um, ever because we had uh, game designers who are hired from the RPG world, artists who had never done pixel art before um, and an animators who've done cartoons and we had technical writers and that was just a no the programmers weren't my responsibility that's about that's what we didn't do but we had a programming team so i i wrote out the whole life cycle of coleco or to the coleco vision you mean like donkey kong coleco vision uh that was my first yeah i worked on that ah, okay into it okay um and then jump when the collapse happened in 83 84 85 um we were kicked out the door in 85 um floated around, ended up freelancing for about seven years in games, in tabletop games, video games, did some work for EA, did some work for Interplay, um, and then ended up um, at TSR painting book covers. The awesome. 
and drivers. I ended up painting book covers for them. From there, I jumped back into video games. So was just before TSR was sold, sold uh, to Wizards of the Coast, I jumped back into video games and became a level designer designer at id Software. Uh, worked on Quake 2, uh, Quake 3, Quake 3 Team Arena, and then jumped from there over to Ensemble Studios, um, ended up working as an artist on Age of Empires 3 and Halo Wars, and then um, kind of finished things out working as lead level designer on the World of Darkness MMO for um, uh, CCP, and then left there um, while it was still, before it got canceled. <laughs> this is so fantastic. Know your history, people. We are living it. Ah, okay, I'm here right. Thank you for sure. Jim Simmons, you're here too. Yeah. Hey, Janelle, when you were working on the D and D stuff, did you ever get the opportunity to work with Dave Arneson? Oh, hell yes. Pardon me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually small small worldism. We actually hired him and people from his company. Yeah. Um, Adventure Games, I think it was called at the time, to work on doing documentation for the ColecoVision games because yeah. we were short staff. So yeah, I got to work with um, Dave. I've known, I knew Dave back then. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've done a couple of projects with Dave, 80s, 90s, in, in the mid 80s and, and I guess mid 90s. And as I was thinking about Danny uh, a couple of days ago, I sort of, it reminded me of a trait that I experienced in working with Danny and with working with Dave Arneson that they shared that I really enjoyed. And it was that in working with them on some game design stuff, we ended up sitting on the floor and being nine-year-olds, nine-year-old, 10 years old, and they both had this incredible ability to just jump right into their nine-year-old selves and just be silly, wacky, I'm going to break the rules and see if I can get away with it and giggling and just doing all these things that were like you'd observe in a play session with kids. You know what I mean? And it's like what bubbled out of that joyful, you know, child stuff was great game fun that, we, you know, it found its way into what was happening. When I used to hire um, product managers at an electronic toy company I worked with, the Nolan Bushnell startup. Um, I used to tell the product managers I'd hire, I'd say, now usually when I walk by your office, about 50% of the time I expect you to be sitting on the floor playing with toys. The ones that their competitors make are the ones that, that we're making. And if you can't, you know, kind of get into that frame of mind, well, take your MBA somewhere else, you know what I mean? Because we're, uh, we're trying to get in touch with that part of ourselves. And so it's something that you're playing mule with Danny sitting on the floor, it was just giggle 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 you know and just fun 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 and uh you know he'd set me up in a trap i'd buy into it she'd crush me you know and go from there same thing with uh with dave arneson we'd be playing something and they would say and my di dinosaur crushes your army jeep and i go wait a minute that wasn't part of the rules and he said no but it wasn't not part of the rules so i get away with it <laughs> so yeah. okay okay and they were, they were similar in that respect. Um, anyway, Gordon, it's my turn to uh, um, tell about myself. Um, uh, 1970s uh, art school um, in, uh, in LA, experimental animation, uh, photography, um, uh, 10 years of being a bum traveling around the country and uh, not doing anything really worthwhile. You know, things like teaching university and being a newspaper photographer, boring, boring stuff. And then, um, Graduate school at Stanford, did fiction screenwriting, finished up in uh, summer of 1984. Nolan Bushnell's um, seven year non compete clause with uh, Time Warner um, was over, and he was allowed to get back in the inter entertainment business or toy business. Um, I did a three day freelance writing assignment and uh, turned it in. They called me back the next day, said, Would you like to edit this? Be the editor. Had about six writers so did that um let everybody go kept me on to uh, work on some other paper game ideas that nolan had and it just turned into a career um fortunate for me because 
while I was at Stanford, I spent a huge amount of time in the microcomputer lab where they had every type of personal computer that was made at the time in the lab. And I spent a lot of my time over there playing Temple of Apshai on a Hewlett Packard HP 150 with a touch screen and uh, Flight Simulator on uh, one of the first uh, IBM PC Juniors, I think it was, the little peanut crazy thing, and a few other, and a few other things. And so I wanted to get into the game industry and I was looking at um, SSI was a company in the Bay Area I really liked, but, um, and I didn't even bother with EA and I found out many years later that, um, nope, my intuition was correct without a ability to program, they wouldn't have hired me. Well, that's, uh, that's not my skill. Um, they tried to hire me a few years later and said, well, we don't require your programming skills anymore. Would you like to blah, blah, blah. Um, anyway, that got me in, um, worked for Nolan for a couple of years. We had an R&D agreement with Hasbro. We developed an interactive video type project with them. Um, I was development director on that for a couple of years. Um, went to LA, worked for Disney for a couple of years. EA um, got in touch with me. I met people at Game Developers Conference, Rich Hillman, Stuart Bond. Um, they invited me to come up and uh, interview, and I started working a couple of months later. I was at EA for four years, went down to MGM for a couple of years, um, went to North Carolina a few years, came to New Zealand 15 years ago, worked for a wonderful little game company in Wellington for five years, and for the last few years, I've been out of the game business, although uh, my current project is uh, doing a game design concept for a client in the U.S., um, for something that we're just in the early, early stages of right now. Um, while I was at EA, I worked with Danny Button on a, a famous project that may get discussed today. And, uh, and uh, I know all the secrets about that one. So I'll hand it back to you, Gordon. Oh, well, the, well no, this is what we're, we're here. I mean, uh, obviously, I mean, everyone, maybe everyone doesn't say, I wouldn't be here without Jim Simmons. These are facts. But that might be a story for another day. Let's you? talk about Danny Button. Well, Jim, well, one question. Sure. When you, were, when you were in Wellington, was it a company called She Interactive? Is That's that who I worked for for five years, yes. Did we meet there? Hmm? I think we met there. It's very possible. Yeah, because I remember- Very I possible. Me there. Okay. Hmm? Yeah, I think we met there. I just go ahead. Okay, cool. Yeah. They're called PickPock now, and everything they do is uh, phone games, you know mobile mobile apps and stuff like that but wonderful place um just a wonderful place as is new zealand what can i say oh beautiful country yes it's gordon no no i this is great this is super real i love that you're connecting again in the 2020s like this is something for everyone to learn as you, yeah. you've heard their histories in the game industry but you're also seeing their presence and all of you who are maybe just embarking upon your careers this is going to be what it is like. <laughs> you're going to go, you're going to go disconnect, you're going to have reimaginations, reinventions. You're all going to be Renaissance people before this coil is, is you know, fully turned. And it's just great to hear real Renaissance stories. I would offer that Danny was also a Renaissance woman and that in her career and in her creativity, she, in fact, you know, some people have to say, act, let the world act on them. Danny Button acted on the world, all right? She acted on the world with her creations, with the, with the mechanics, with the aesthetics that she actually brought to our craft. So maybe for people who are not familiar, yeah, paint a picture, maybe, you know, take us back to those seven cities of gold. What is Mule? Let's, let's just talk about it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still borrowing Danny design tricks in everything I do. <laughs> You know, the community stuff, um, the, you know, we're working together, but competing that, that, that interesting balance, which is one of my favorites. Yeah. Well, mule is a great example, right? So mule, like I remember playing multiplayer mule. I was, I was a child for mm -hmm. sure. Like long before I got my EA play four way play, we were playing multiplayer mule. I can say on my, on the Commodore 64. Mm -hmm. Maybe talk about what that was like when you were in the craft. All of you were in the craft when these games were coming out, right? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. talk about talk about her impact. Talk about what these games meant to you. Um, I played the first uh, Danny game I played was Seven Cities of Gold for hundreds of hours. 
it was, um, I love exploration games. Um, I love resource balancing games. Um, I, um, you know, I couldn't win a, um, I couldn't win an arcade game like Re like Rebecca did to save my life. I need a turn-based game. I need things to slow down. But uh, and so I really enjoyed that. Although the auction aspect of Mule is like that's one of the most intense game experiences you can get into um, with you know three other players. And the better you know those people, the better because uh, you know the the nastier it can get. Um, but um, it uh, and it's a form. The auction is a form of telling lies and and telling the truth. Because you're like you know you're kind of raising your mule you know your little auction thing up and say oh I'm I'd be happy to bid this for you and you oh okay come down here oh I didn't quite mean that I'm gonna pull it back down and get you to pay a little bit more that whole thing is just devious and and really fun especially if you're talking you know if you're playing in the same room together like you did with mule because we've all got four joysticks and we're talking in addition to what we see on the screen you know graphical representation of my bid we're talking to each other oh man are we talking trash oh man are we saying oh no i'll make that deal with you come on over here i'll do that oh well i maybe i'm thinking about that a little differently now that you're here that kind of stuff and that was the stuff that when you played mule with danny she was a master at and got no end of fun out of tricking you and uh, and having you you know fall into all those little traps and stuff which is you know the whole communal experience you know everybody's talked i mean you know i've read a million times Danny telling people that the only truly happy growing up experience she's had inside her family was when they all played board games together. And she was the oldest of four or five kids. I was the oldest of four or five kids. And that's something we both kind of related to having to wrestle your little brothers and sisters into playing a game with you. You're going to beat them, but, and they know it. And it's like, so you got to make it fun for them. We learned rubber banding by helping our little brothers and sisters stay in the game, right? So um, playing that with Danny and seeing that, all that fun that she was having, and we talked a little bit about our growing up experiences and our families and all that sort of stuff. So I knew some of that, um, I had fun playing it with myself. I know that the Ozark Softscape people that created um, Seven Cities of Gold, they had so much fun playing games together. It's like, you know, Mule was like, they would, while working on Seven Cities, they'd take breaks to play Mule to just, you know, get the juices flowing and have fun again. At least I wasn't there, but that's the way I'm, I've told, been told the story. Jim Rushing, you know, he was at Ozark Softscape and he was a producer at EA when I was a producer at EA. So it was really fun comparing some of those stories. How about you, Rebecca and Janelle? Do you have any experiences playing these games? Well, my experience playing that particular game is actually almost non-existent because, for one, at that particular point in my life, I had no friends and I was a AAA introvert because mostly I had a, you know, secret, as in my name wasn't, you know, I had, I told everybody to call me Burger because my name was actually Becky, but no one knew that. Mm -hmm. However, um, I was given the source code to Mule back then because I was offered the opportunity to port Mule to the Apple II. Um, however, I was also um, supposed to do the port to rock, sorry, um, racing destruction set to the Atari 800. And I couldn't do two projects at the same, those two at the same time. So it ended up that I did a uh, racing destruction set. And after doing racing destruction set, the mule project fizzled out. And I, and I moved on to other games. And of course, I was more, since I really didn't have any friends to you know, sit down and play um, Mule with. It's, Mule's a boring game if you're by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it came into my life. I actually played with my best friend. So my, 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 my best friend had the Intellivision of the Commodore 64 and I would go to his house and we would play. And this was, I mean, I was a big sporty spice person. So I love like the baseball and the football and whatever. However, Mule, I, we didn't have a word for genres back then. Like there was no way to describe it. You kind of just had to play it. Um, it was just so meaningful. That dynamic, and, and Jim spoke to it, of, of sitting with friends, but having to find that common ground. It, it sort of reminds me of you played Risk, the negotiations around borders, 
at risk when they become weak. And you go, did we say six turn treaty? I meant three of mine, three of yours, six turns. Um, it was it was so um, forward thing, so progressive to give people that power, that agency, that type of play back then. So I didn't have um, any experience really with Mule. I know I played Seven Cities of Gold on the map um, late '80s because yeah. it could be played alone. So and I was just, I've always been a solo gamer. Um, one of the things I remember most about, let's say, that whole EA album style of game back then was this whole, they were pushing the creators. So we were aware that the Buttons were creating games um, and the other creators were making um, these really cool titles. When I say we, we at Coleco, we were literally hidden away in a box. Mm. We weren't allowed to even interact with people, with our peers at other country companies. We didn't know who they were. Nobody knew who we were. So that was one of our, my takeaway from that time is we were, you know, we were all um, kept in the dark until, uh, you know, like mushrooms until we were canned. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> well, that's what happens today. The, the battle for credits, right, continues well, like over our entire well, lifetimes. We got nothing back then. <laughs> fight for several years before we got credits in our own games yeah mm -hmm. but, um i did not get any i really don't have a lot of play experience with danny's games other than a little bit of playing seven cities of gold yeah on the credit subjects i remember at every play i was being getting hints that they were not going to put our names in the games so i be, i got a huge reputation of signing my games by putting things like if you typed in the word burger you would be killed horribly in the game <laughs> certain key combinations when the game boots up it'll put a picture of literally my head getting chopped off but the whole point was that if years later someone would say oh becky didn't work on that game then i would say well then why is it if you go in this room and you type in the word burger <laughs> happens then at that point it's irrefutable proof that i worked on that game and that if somebody tries to erase my uh, legacy um, they're going to have egg on their face, and it's actually happened. I've had people present day try to say, oh, no, Becky didn't work on that game, or Becky had no involvement on that game, and I, <laughs> burger here, and then explain the way, explain that. <laughs> that sounds, I mean, so important. I mean, I don't know if that was the birth of the Easter egg that we're also learning about, but the importance of pride, like, right? Pride in your work, pride in who you are. Um, <laughs> that even then you were taking those steps like, you know, if it will not be granted extrinsically, intrinsically it will be like, it's in the game yeah. <laughs> to take an EA phrase. You were gonna say something, Jim. Let me tell some Danny uh, stories. That's yes. why we're here. Okay. So I'd spent some time, you know, a couple of days ago saying, okay, let's sit down and do the memory banks and remember all the good Danny stuff that I can remember. Um, so I've got, some stories, maybe not for public consumption, but the, uh, if not some, now, I've when, some good ones. If not now, uh, when? What are you saving them for? We are here. Yeah, um, I don't know who's in the audience. Here we go. Yes. <laughs> okay, so believe it or not, I first met Danny Button in 1971. Okay. Danny Button started a 10-speed bicycle shop in Fayetteville, Arkansas, not far off the university campus with one of my childhood friends, Bobby Young. They started this business together called High Roller Cyclery. It's still in business in the same location. When I met Danny at a game developers conference in the early 90s, we started talking and found out, oh, you're from Arkansas. I'm from Arkansas. Where? Fayetteville, Little Rock. Oh, I, you know, I had a bicycle shop there. I said, what? And he said, high roller. And I said, Bobby had the bicycle shop. Um, she said, well, I owned half of it. And did you used to come in? I said, yeah, all the time. Talk to Bobby. He said, you ever see anybody back in the back fixing the bikes? I said, yeah. He said, me. I said, oh, yeah. Beard, long hair, big smile. And we realized we, we didn't know each other, but we kind of knew each other since then. Because um, I grew up in Fayetteville, and like I say, went to the university when uh, Danny was going there, and so we knew each other. So 
fast forward, what, 20 years? And we meet each other at the Game Developers Conference. I've been playing Seven Cities of Gold. I've been playing Command HQ. I've been playing, you know, Danny Button games. And so another producer um, that I worked with at Disney said, you know, I said, oh, you know, I'd love to meet Danny Button. He says, oh, yeah, I'll introduce you to Dan, you know. And so they, he takes me over there and I stand in a little circle of people, you know, people talking to Danny. And I'm very shy. Um, I got the Rebecca syndrome. I didn't know how to talk and, you know, and this and that. And I was standing in a circle of, of legends, you know, and little old me. And so I didn't say anything. I just kind of listened in and went away. The next day I got up enough nerve to go over and actually introduce myself and say, I'm a big fan, you know, the, the you know, the fanboy stuff. And that's when we found out about the Arkansas connection and we just had a blast and it was really fun. We talked about maybe we'd do a game together and I just thought, oh my God, did I just hear that? And Danny, and I told Danny something, I was investigating some artificial life stuff and she loaded me up with books to read by O.S. Wilson and this and that. I mean, understood deep, not deeply, but you know, well, broadly enough what I was thinking about to us get a real spark. And I just, I went back home with a, a bookshelf of books to read, which I started devouring. Then the next year or sometime we got in touch and started talking about, you know, doing something. And that's when I got the, the understanding from Danny that, oh, no, 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 I only do my games. I don't, I don't design with other people. I don't, I don't do that. You know, it's like, it's my thing. Like, oh, okay, okay, back off on that. That was fun. Um, nothing came of that, but it was an interesting conversation because I began to get insights into Danny's, um, I don't, I want to use the word ego very carefully because ego is a very healthy thing. You know, it supports us, it motivates, it, it drives us, it, it helps us understand ourselves. So Danny's ego, the healthy ego, was in touch with how she ticked, how she worked. This is how I work, this is what I do, this is what I know, and you know, I know what I, I want, and this and that. Very healthy stuff, very good. Um, so then I go to EA, I show up summer of 92, Sometime in the autumn of 92, Rich Hilleman comes to me and says, um, we've got Danny Button working on this project with us. Went, oh, and uh, the producer who's currently working with Danny is getting really swamped with another project, can't really follow through. And I understand you know Danny, would you like to be the producer on this? Oh, oh my gosh, yes, yes, yes. So, um, we get in touch, we have a phone call, Danny, oh yeah, I remember you, you, oh, this is great, and we just love fest, and this is going to be great, um, and then I, um, uh, Hilleman gives me sort of a, you know, a rundown on the state of the project, and what the deal is, and what the arrangement is, um, EA had decided to go back to those original 10 artists, the, um, the, the record album artists, you know, that, that Rebecca mentioned, um, and see how many of them they could sign up to do another project, a 10th anniversary new project. So Bill Budge was one of them, and I got to be Bill Budge's producer on uh, Virtual Pinball. It was a Sega Genesis version of Pinball Construction Set. And Danny on what was, is popularly known as Son of Mule or Mule 2 or something like that. Well, not many people have seen the contract for that project other than me. And so there's a lot of things about the relationship between EA and Danny on that project that um, haven't come out or have come out in odd ways. Um, it was not going to be Mule. The agreement was that Danny would learn to program the Genesis by mocking up Mule, just getting Mule up and running. And then based on what she learned about what the console was capable of, she would design a new game. Oh, okay. And, Makes and do that. Okay. That was the idea. It wasn't going to be a mule. But the project was a real struggle. And technically it wasn't coming together um, as smoothly as everyone had hoped. And um, because that technically it wasn't coming together, there wasn't a lot of you know fresh new game design thinking going on. And when push came to shove, Danny said, I'm just gonna do Mule. 
just I'm not going to bother with something else. We were running behind schedule and all that sort of stuff. And so it was going to turn into, it was going to be that. Um, so in talking with the marketing department, they were not as enthusiastic about that because they didn't feel the Sega Genesis target market at that time was a match for the game structure and play of Mule. I'm not saying I agree with them or anything, but that was the thinking at the time. And so it got a little frustrating for everybody, you know, you know for everybody. Um, marketing sucks. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Marketing sucks. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so, <clears throat> here's, the, here's the famous thing about Son of Mule and Danny. Um, how do I know this? I, I, there's a sequence of steps. How do I do this? I opened up Computer Gaming World one month, and after the project was over, and there's a, in the editorial page, Russell Sype is telling a story about having run into Danny at Game Developers Conference, and Danny saying, I had to, I had to quit doing Mule. I had to kill the project. And why? Because EA wanted to put guns and bombs in it. And I read that and I went, what? <laughs> I called Russell up. I said, Russell, you're a journalist, right? And he says, yeah, I'm a journalist. And I said, tell me what two sides of this story you got before you, before you wrote it and published it. And he said, well, there wasn't another side. I just said this. I said, there's an EA side. Oh, I said, guess what? And I've known Russell for a few years. I said, I happen to be the producer on that one. He said, oh. And I told him my side of the story. He went, oh. I said, so next month you're going to like publish something that kind of sets this straight. And he said, no. I said, oh, Russell. He said, okay, let me think about it. Never happened, of course. So that's the story that's out, is that EA wanted to put guns and bombs in Mule and Danny had to kill it. Yes, guns and bombs got mentioned in a conversation with Danny by a, an assistant producer who'd had some conversation with the marketing people who were kind of, you know, bouncing some stuff around. They just wanted something vicious that a teenage kid could do to one of their competitors. Like, you know, when I go out with my mule and I'm exploring, if I could drop a secret bomb in the sand somewhere where I know one of my enemies is going to go just to mess them up. That, that you know, they're just spitball brainstorming kind of stuff. And Danny said, no. And it was like, yeah, okay, you know, but that doesn't come as any surprise. I was pretty much relegated to, we're gonna have Mule on the Genesis, and I don't know how I can get marketing excited about it, but there you go. It was the most generous contract you've ever seen in the game industry. X number of dollars per month for as many months as it takes to finish the project. Any game design you choose to do, and you can cancel the project at any time for no stated reason. Oh my. You ever seen a contract like that? Oh, that's I'd how, like, I'd love one. That's how yeah. bad EA wanted Dan to work with Danny to develop a game. Mm -hmm. And it was Rich Hillman made the contract. That's why I've read that Rich says he was the last producer that worked with Danny. Um, well, I was, but Rich was the last one to sign a contract. And when I inherited that contract, I went to Rich. I said, what? He said, yep. That's the deal. So when Danny called me to cancel the contract, it was a very simple conversation. Well, this hasn't gone well and this is over. The friend wanted to say, Danny, what, what's the deal? But the professional had to just follow the, had the, it was a really awkward conversation. I was talking to a friend, but there were things I couldn't say because we had to have an official producer to developer conversation. And I simply pulled out the contract. I read the paragraph and I said, well, that's pretty straightforward, didn't it? And she said, yeah. And we both hung up the phone feeling like, well, okay, that's that, but felt pretty bad about it. Saw each other at the next game developers conference. Everything's fine. All that sort of stuff. But, but, after that game developers conference is when Russell published the thing about guns and bombs and all that. And I went, oh no, 
I have just now told this story publicly for the first time ever. Danny's not here to uh, say anything about it one way or another. Danny's programmer on that project would be, and we've talked about it and we understand it. But I will say this, it was a tough year for Danny. A yeah. couple of months after I started working on the project with her, I got a call from her and she said, Jim, I need to talk to you about something. And I said, yeah. She said, um, and I don't remember the exact words, but as best as I recall, um, I'm gonna have a sex change. You know, who knows in 1992, you know, I mean, it's probably not even PC now, you know, to, to go about that way. But, but that was the thing. I didn't say anything. It was quiet for quite a while. And she said, oh my gosh, did I shock you? I said, no. I said, I was trying to figure out if you were kidding or not. And now I realize you're not. And so now I'm ready to be shocked. But no, I guess. And we spent an hour on the phone talking through all kinds of things, life history, attitude, fears, how did I, how did we come here? All the things that, you know, we understand better now than we did, how many years ago are we talking about? Are we talking 28 years? 92? It's been yeah. A, yeah. It's a different world. Yeah, it's a, it's a totally different world. Back then, I so yeah. that was a, you know, it was huge. The next time the project needed to come to review, I've got about three little stories I'm going to tell on it. Maybe we're running a little bit out of time. We're going to we run. No, we're going to run. Talk, tell your stories. We're here. Okay. Danny Button's time. Um, We've got time. So the next time it's time to bring the project to, you know, the review committee um, at EA, I realized the night before, oh my gosh. A lot of these people in this review, they've known Danny for, you know, 10 years or more. And um, I've got to go in there and talk about a person that they is not the person they think I'm going to talk about. So I sent an email out to everybody who is going to be in the meeting and said, a little something you need to know. I said, during this meeting, I'm going to be talking about um, Danny button and I'm going to be using the pronoun she. And I talked them through as simply as possible. The, the situation. Some of the people in the meeting um, were just fine. They just rolled with it. And other people, they would hear she and I would hear Snickers at the end of the table. Snickers, snickering, you know, a little chuttering. It's just, it was just hard for them. I'm not saying they were laughing at. It's just, you know, the, when we get into conflict, internal conflict, and we chuckle, it was that kind of a thing. Eventually, one guy just said, he just said, I just can't handle this because this is a person who knew Danny really well, you know, in the early days of getting um, seven cities out and all that sort of stuff. It was a real struggle. Um, now, you know, you knew Danny when yeah. she came out, stayed in the EA apartment across the street. You were yeah. staying there yeah. and, um, and, you know, and she was um, she had, was dressing as a woman, yeah. and uh, and so you had that relationship with her. But now I want to tell one more story that was after the EA meeting and all that sort of stuff. No, no, it was before that, but before you met. Okay. okay. So in January, I went to Little Rock to spend a few days working with Danny and, uh, the, and, and the small team there. And I took an artist with me from San Francisco. Danny couldn't find a good artist um, in Little Rock to you know, kind of rise the level of what the Genesis could do and this and that. I found this incredible woman in San Francisco, um, super punked out woman with you know, kind of spiky reddish hair and this and that, a black leather, uh, you know, it was about, I think all she owned. And uh, her artwork was great and had a, a, a kind of a fun thing, but a little edge to it. And I thought this is kind of fun and let's see how we go. Um, she came with me to, um, you know, we had a phone conversation before and they'd met over the phone and, you know, kind of we liked long, liked each other's, um, um, Danny liked her, uh, the game she'd worked on in the past. I can't remember the name. I can't remember, you know, what those games were. Sorry about that. So anyway, we fly into Little Rock and we check into a motel and Danny comes and has dinner with us, um, at a cafe, um, near the hotel. 
Um, Danny comes in, jeans, flannel shirt, boots, rough guy, tough guy, you know, comes in and we have, uh, have dinner. And she says, now, tomorrow is my first day living and dressing as a woman all the time. And that's the requirement that I go through one year during my transition of always being a woman. So tomorrow morning starts that. And then, you know, just you guys are here and that, that'll be fun. We go, okay, great. So the next morning at a Waffle House in Little Rock, Arkansas, the artist and I are, have sat down, we're a little early and Danny's a little late and finally arrives, walks through the door, high heels, beautiful plaid wool dress skirt, stockings, blouse, little scarf, brooch, big earrings, hair, you know, the, the, the picture that you've got that you're using of Danny right now, yeah. that, that's who walked in the door sat down and we had a breakfast. And one of the first things she said was, oh, you know, one of the things I hadn't thought of, God, it's a lot of work being a woman. <laughs> it took me forever to do my hair and the makeup, I've still got to get that right and this and that. And it was, it was funny. Um, and she said, this is gonna be more work than I thought. Then halfway through, the breakfast, I mean, like I say, Waffle House in the South, 1992, waitress, halfway through the breakfast, waitress comes, filling up some coffee cups, asking for anything more, leaves, and Danny turns and looks to me and the artist and he says, well, there we had it. And I went, what? And she said, the look. I said, what? She said, oh, there's a point when someone's dealing with you and all of a sudden they realize, oh, that's not a woman. And you get the look. And she said, that was it. Did you see it? And I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I know just exactly what you're talking about. I didn't get it at the time, but she said, that's it. She said, I'm kind of glad I had it this morning because I'm going to get it lots and this is just, part of my journey. Um, it's just one of those funny things. You know, it's like, we're always perceiving how people perceive us. And there's this sharp distinction point that just, you have to cope with. I don't, I've never experienced it, but I was in the room having someone explain and show it to me, which is pretty moving. Yeah, because that's one of the issues why, you know, we fight so hard for trans rights is that mm -hmm. for people who are not trans, you could truly never understand the crap we go through. Um, now, my case, I'm going to speak for myself, is that I transitioned almost 20 years ago. And mm -hmm. for the first couple of years, I got the look all the time. And it really stabs you in the heart and it makes just going through the day difficult and unfortunately it drives most people who are trans into a, such a depression that unfortunately um danny suffered you know couldn't recover um but as time goes on you get less and less of a look to the point of um true story here i was working at a very large corporation just a few years back and I was already working there for six months. And then somebody comes up to me, uh, one of the employees, and says, hey, you want to go out for coffee? I said, sure. And we sat down. And the first thing out of his mouth was, I Googled your name. He says, oh, really? And I would have never known. And mm -hmm. so like, OK, well, this is what it is today. It's one where the, when someone realizes that I'm a trans woman, um, they are so incredulous, kind of like, how? You know, they look at me and my face and everything and all my mannerisms and everything. And they're like, they just can't see that. But back to the time of your Waffle House thing was where Danny still had all that training that she had gone through for her life from, you know, from being yeah. a little girl to that time. And there's all these mannerisms and hidden um, 
body language that unfortunately gives you away and it gives the look and mm -hmm. unfortunately it is soul crushing it is so soul crushing mm -hmm. and she was working on it because you know the man that walked in for dinner the woman who came in for breakfast was floated across the room and she was working on those mannerisms and on that you know on trying to get get it right and to, I know she wanted it to feel right, but at that stage, it's more acting than just being. And it, it, the transition is behavior as much as mental and physical and everything else. Yeah, now here's an interesting truism for many trans people. Before they come out, mm -hmm. they try to bury what they really are because they know that if they ever come out, the social stigma is going to put them through that year of hell. Mm -hmm. However, many trans people <laughs> try to bury it by exaggerating what's supposed to be the assigned gender at birth. So like with Annie, when you first met her, like I met her at a GDC, she was like all this hyper male and so forth. And I was looking like, man, are you okay? <laughs> Is there something wrong with you? Uh, but it's all part of trying to be this. It's like a woman since birth being having to disguise themselves as a man and trying everything they can to stay disguised as a man and not get caught. Um, and it kind of looks cartoonish, but when you drop the act, you still have remnants of that, but then the real person actually shows up and that facade they've been wearing all those years goes away. Like, um, I'll go again with my own experience, is that people who knew me during the years at Interplay when I presented as a male, um, I was always shy, uh, hidden, um, and did everything I could to avoid people. And it was not because of that I was an introvert. I was actually an extrovert. It was because I didn't want people to see me because I was so embarrassed of what I looked like. <laughs> that was the, my truth. <laughs> When uh, the, one of my favorite little Danny stories that she told me was that when she told her mother, you know, the big reveal, when she told her mother, her mother's response was very simple. But Danny, you're too tall to be a woman. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not like there isn't women, there aren't women out there that are seven feet tall. I mean, they exist. <laughs> yeah. Danny wasn't seven feet tall, but, but she was tall. She was tall. Yeah. Six foot three, I believe. Um, but I, um, I also want to acknowledge that the following uh, couple of years were um, um, very difficult for for Danny and her family and her relationships with uh, her mother and uh, her brother, who was one of the one of the Ozark Softscape people, um, Bill, and it was that was really hard for Danny um, to to lose to be rejected. And rejection is a little strong a word, but I think it's a little too strong. I wish it was a better word, but it was a form of rejection that um, that was really hard. Sometimes it would be not speaking, just, you know, just don't want to have anything to do with you. But that went up and down. That went up and down. And when Danny was, uh, was in the end with, uh, with the lung cancer, um, the family came around. And there, there was a, my best understanding, because I talked to Danny um, when she was in the hospital, and things were, were really dire. Um, at that time, she was, um, she said, no, I'm, the family is with me, you know, in, in spirit you know not not right that day i was on the phone but they're talking and and healing and that was well that was really good for me to hear because i know that that first year or two was was rough we actually have a question from the crowd yeah um the question is um thank you lance what are your opinions on the idea of passing as a trans person and how did it affect you internally over time i'm a trans man and i deal with the internal struggle of passing on a daily basis. I can agree it's not fun. <laughs> um, Want to take it? I'll, I'll take it from me. Um, we, you know, you talk about being tall, Danny being tall for a woman. I'm six foot four. And I'm also very large. 
So I have both of those going for me. The idea is, is um, for me, transitioning the day I went from saying I'm presenting as male to I am presenting exclusively as female. For me, it was like dropping the cloak off my shoulders. I let go that all that maleness that I had literally had to work to keep wrapped around myself to, to create this illusion of who I was, I just let that go. And a lot of the fluidity, a lot of the softness, it all came forward at that point. But the point of really to try and be trans in a cisgender world, there, it's not so much about trying to pass as your authentic gender, it's blending into a society so just people don't notice you. Um, the world, everyone, we live in a really diverse world of uh, physically. And the idea is find a way to be just a little bit different from the canon Barbie doll norm and be comfortable in that and be yourself in it. If people perceive you as being comfortable with who you are, not constantly set, trying to figure out is somebody noticing me, is somebody watching me, um, people are going to be less concerned that there's something different about you. What's the transition from, from I'm concerned about being noticed from, okay, now I've been noticed, from concern with what someone thinks about that? I mean, you know, now, now we're getting into their kind of attitudes about stuff, not just awareness, but because I'm sure once that, you know, the look, the, you know, that moment passes, now you're perceiving approval, disapproval, and coping with disapproval from people that, you know, perfect strangers, that's, that's something we have to deal with. And human nature means we don't like being disapproved of. Yeah. Yeah, well, I go with the issues that uh, I'll go with my own plan is that when I first decided that I was going to go through with it, um, mm -hmm. certain people did all tracks, but then I immediately saved up the money to do facial surgery because I knew that if someone gave me the look, we were at the time, this is 2003, 2004, that was still a time where you would get murdered for yeah. getting the look. Someone would look at you, they would then see you that way, and then they would actually kill you. Um, but I also had to worry about things like somebody, let's say the waitress at the Waffle House, she could have put something in my pancakes because, you know, she doesn't want, she hates these kind of people and so forth for, for whatever reason. I didn't want to live in a life that way in which I'm constantly having to look over my shoulder for somebody who's going to attack me, all because mm -hmm. they gave me the look. So, you know, after notifying my people at the time of Electronic Arts, let them know within a couple of months i was on my way to a surgeon i came back and after i healed um i rarely got the look from strangers because since they had never seen me before they have no idea who and what i was so there's not this just crazy curly haired woman just walking by and so they would serve me a burger and no one would care uh, which is perfectly fine by me um, also, it helped me get jobs later on so that after leaving EA and doing other projects, you know, when I would come in to do an interview, um, they would say, oh, female programmer. In fact, that was, they light up it's like, oh my God, a programmer who's female actually knows what she's doing. Cool. And of course I have to deal with that stereotype and bias, <laughs> but that's the different thing, but at least that bias doesn't get me killed. Um, but back to what I was saying is that the blending in is i wasn't transitioning to shock anyone i was just transitioning to live an authentic life and i really wanted to make it as comfortable not just for me but for everyone else around me especially people who i have never met and i'll probably never will meet again when i walk into a restaurant some rest random place and order my meal and they just think it's just some woman sitting in there which is quite frankly what the truth is is just some woman sitting in the booth who wants to chow mein. i mean that's really yeah. it danny's voice um always remained uh you know um, um danny said i just can't get my voice high enough he says i'm working on that i'm trying to do that 
but Danny's voice never really settled in a place to me. Right. There was, it was always a little bit different voice. She was working on that constantly. And she said, I don't think I'll ever get there. I actually talked to her about that. Um, yeah. I, I got on her case about her smoking. That was her problem. She kept smoking yeah. and smoking and smoking. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. smoking deepens voices. Have you ever heard the yeah. voice of a woman who's been smoking all the time? She smelled yeah. constant in yeah. thinking. She has a very low voice. Well, so I was just telling Danny, um, you're not doing yourself any favors. Stop smoking. And then you can work on your voice. She yeah. refused to do it. So of course she just kept complaining yeah. instead of doing you know, that, that does bring back me. The, I only met Danny once. And then really mm -hmm. it wasn't a met so much as I sat in, I think it was the 98 uh, GDC in Long Beach. She did a big seminar. She had a big, one of the big room seminars. And I, I wanted to at least, this was long before I transitioned. I wanted at least to be in the presence of someone who had transitioned and done it successfully. And so I went and sat and listened to her talk. And that is one of the things I noticed. So she still had that um, very deep, um, the smoker's, the smoker's gra a gravelly voice. Maybe that's a proper, mm -hmm. voice. a little bit gravelly. Mm -hmm. Your voice, yeah. Janelle, your voice, Rebecca. I love your voices. They're wonderful. Uh, we, I know for me, I went through a year of therapy to get to this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's work, 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 work. <laughs> It's a musical same, instrument. Same here. I took voice training. Um, I already had a natural high pitched voice to begin with because I never. Uh -huh. um, but how? But I went through the training, and it was very difficult. I had to spend yeah. many, many hours practicing both singing and uh, just saying it over and over again because um, you can't cut corners. You yeah. have to yeah. do work. And again, the way I went through it is. I had the privilege, and I'm going to use the word privilege, of being able to go beach work with one of the best voice coaches in the country. Um, she happened to live in Seattle, and, and I could take a bus to go to go um, have my sessions with her. And I think I went through two sessions, probably for about four or five months. But it's like learning to play an instrument. You have to it. It you have to learn how to make how the instrument makes its sounds, and then you control those sounds. Yeah. Doesn't it? Doesn't it seem odd that it takes an incredible amount of work to be your true, authentic self? Doesn't sound right, does it? Well, that's because it should be natural. Well, it's because we got the. Um, with the 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 chassis didn't match the uh, <laughs> the operating system. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I actually have a question of how do you today? It's twenty twenty. Um, how do you balance um, trans pride, right? Pride in your process to be your authentic self um, with the the place that you are. You're you're living your lives authentically as who you are. So there is the opportunity to pass and move forward and not necessarily look back to people may, who may be at a different point in their path, right? Like how do you sort of balance that? Like being presence in the, in the trans developers of the future, right? Look in this room, they might be 20 something or 30 something and on their way, but in a different place than where you are. I like to look at myself as what, they, what Janelle coined, the possibility model. I mean, mm what somebody could possibly be at the end of your journey. Um, this is, you know, it's a realistic goal. It's not like saying, because when you first start your journey and I will, and I'm again, personal experience, there are many times that you look in the mirror and go like, why am I doing this? I will never ever pass. I will never sound right. I will never, it's despite the fact that I have friends mine saying like, man, you sound just like a girl. Um, but. I'm always so judgmental on myself that it makes me want to quit from, you know, from time to time. But I <laughs> slugged it out. I put in the work. The time went on. I went through the surgeries. Um, and it took a long, long time. Because there is the problem is that so many people who begin their journeys want it over in six months. And I you know, all oh, I would do is sit now. in the corner and, and and laugh at them because I'm like, no. You're, once you start this journey, we're going to be talking about two to three years 
before you get to the point where the only person who thinks you're trans is you, because everyone else who looks at you will see you as your authentic self and not even bat an eye while you're saying, oh my God, they're all gonna know who I am. They're all gonna know who I am. It's like, who are you? You're just a okay. scared girl. <laughs> well, one of the choices I made, um, and I had to think through this because um, I came out to, it's only been just a bit over nine years since I actually came out to myself first. You know, I know that I'd known I was different since I was a child, but I was always in denial about actually being, um, well, back then it was you were a trans, you were a transsexual or you were a cross dresser or all these different words, but I stayed in denial about that until I was in my mid 50s. Um, but when I made that decision, one of the decisions I had to make was do I give up my past and just become anonymous? Do I give up my career and my past? Or do I at least own that part of me and incorporate that into who I am today? And my choice was to incorporate. Um, I think having the reputation I had in both the table, especially in the tabletop role playing game industry, and then again in um, the video game industry with my work with its software, with my work with the Guild Hall, um, that gave me a reputation. And reputation can carry you fairly far because people already have respect for you, who you were. Mm -hmm. And now they're seeing that you've had the courage to make this decision to become who you should be. And that carried over a bit. I think it was actually being a little bit famous a little bit of celebrity actually made it easier for me. Mm -hmm. So I held on to what I did in the past and I actually had two publishers who changed credits in my old products. So thank you to them. Um, oh, that is fantastic. I think um, I'm perhaps the greatest way we've honored Danny Button Verite is by sharing her truth, mm -hmm. right? And being our authentic selves here. I would love to ask you to the degree that you're comfortable, how do people stay in touch with you? People who are seeing this, who are going to be inspired by this, they might even see it later on Twitch and YouTube. I don't know, oh. Rebecca, Janelle, Jim, how do people how do people connect? Well, for me, just go ahead and follow me on uh, Twitter as Burger Becky, B-U-R-G-E-R-B-E-C-K-Y, or just every now and then look at my website at burgerbecky.com. I also have a YouTube channel and Twitch TV channel, which is also Burger Becky. So basically go to any of the um, social media and just look up Burger Becky and that's how you can find me. Um, mine's a little different. I use um, my Facebook or my Twitter. My Twitter account is Janelle Allen, my first name and my middle name. Spell it. Uh, J-E-N-N-E-L-L-A-L-L-Y-N. That's my oh. Twitter account. Um, I don't use that a lot, and I'll be honest, I use, a lot of my posts are political and snarky um, there. Um, but on Facebook is where I do most of my social media these days. Um, I have several accounts. I have my personal account, which I is mostly just for me and, and people who know me. But I do have a professional account under my name, Janelle J. Quays, um, where I talk about what I'm working on. Um, and think, talk of thinking through things, sharing things I'm working on. I've also got um, two other accounts on Facebook. One's called Dragon Girl Studios. It's got a little pur cute purple dragon. Um, that's kind of where I do my art client work. And then the other is uh, Fifth Wall Games and Miniatures, which is my publishing um, company. And, and maybe that's what you close with. What are you in the midst of creating today? Currently, I am working at a company called Deck Nine Games, and I'm working on something I can't talk about. Okay. But at old school, when not on weekends, I am working on something I can talk about: remastering Car Wars, otherwise known as Auto Duel. Oh, nice! And spell and spell old school for everyone's at home, so they can find the old school. Old school. O L D E S K U U L at Twitter. I'm that, is that the Steve Jackson Car Wars game? Or do Steve Jackson games on this? Oh, and Warren uh, Spector? Nope, just Steve Jackson. 
I think he worked with Steve in the you know, early, early days. He had a little, maybe a year or so of working with Steve, which he yeah. said was kind of wild. Yeah, we're having a system shock thing. Um, so, so, he's kind of busy there. Yeah, I don't know. Since like 1978, when I were interviewed with um, Metagaming Concepts back when he was still part of that company. I was okay. my first, first college job interview. Um, I didn't get the job because they hired a secretary instead. Um, but um, what I'm working on these days, I'm doing tabletop stuff mostly, and then doing art, doing art for um, <clears throat> needed, usually marketing and screen art. Um, but I've got two projects. Um, I'm writing a uh, game adventure for the most so for the world's most popular game, fifth edition of the world's most popular game, uh, role-playing game system, which I can't, supposedly can't legally say just because they don't, you're not allowed to officially tie it to, your, to that system. But it's the fifth edition I'm working on. And then I've got, um, I'm rebooting uh, from the ground up a book I did back in the early 90s called Central Casting, which is a character history generation book for uh, role-playing games. And I published it um, through another publisher back in 1990. The rights reverted to me a number of years ago when the publisher disappeared. And I'm kind of doing a ground up reboot and probably about 10 times the original content. So that's been working on that for a couple of years now. Okay. Take uh, all three, oh sorry, just two. So, um, I, I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn. It's real simple. Jim Simmons. If you put Jim Simmons New Zealand in, I'm pro I'm maybe the only one that shows up. Let's see if I can get. Is that coming up on the screen? Yes. There's a website for you. It's mostly photographs, but uh, it's got my email address on it and everything. And you're more than more than welcome to use my email address or message me through Facebook or whatever you want to do on that. Um, so for the last uh, two or three years, um, well, after she, you know, the game company in Wellington, um, I started managing um, uh, production at some uh, boutique um, web app and uh, web web companies with, a, with the clients in uh, New Zealand government, uh, banks, insurance companies, just managing all the designers, business analysts, programmers, you know, just making sure shit got out the door. Um, so I didn't know anything about traditional IT and I was using game industry terminology and people were saying, what the hell are you talking about? And they'd use their terminology and I'd say, what the hell are you talking about? You're supposed to be our boss and you seem to be an idiot, that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, the last two or three years I've been traveling all over New Zealand and Australia, teaching courses in uh, how to get along as we work on technology projects, you know, kind of producer one-on-one stuff, um, better agile team teamwork and a course that uh, I developed on service design. So mostly I work with government agencies in Australia and New Zealand. As you can imagine for the last few months, there's not been much of that going on. We're all sitting down locked in. And so if you're accustomed to going into a room with 20 people and doing a three day training session, you're not doing that. Um, so a little bit of photography work here and there and um, out of the blue, um, somebody that I used to work with called me up and they've got me working on some game design concepts um, that they are uh, got a wee bit of starting funding for and I'll get that stuff done and uh, we'll see how that goes. Awesome. You're literally back in the game just when you thought you were out, you're back in. That's fantastic. Yeah, like, trying wow. to retire, but the phone keeps ringing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, all three of you. Um, this has always been like a, a just a once in a lifetime talk, but hopefully just the beginning of more.